Greetings, and welcome to EHA Unplugged, the official podcast channel of the European Hematology Association, EHA. Hi, everyone, and welcome to EHA Unplugged, EHA's podcast channel. I'm very lucky to be here today with uh, Mr. Jonathan Clark. Jonathan, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'd love to. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Jonathan Clark. Um, I'm 61, and I'm uh, five and a half years in remission after CAR T cell therapy, which is incredible. Um, I have mantle cell lymphoma, which is uh, still on paper uh, incurable, deadly disease. Um, but five and a half years is looking good. It's fantastic. And um, I believe that on the back of that, you also have a sort of a side job in addition, <laughs> and that is um, telling people, telling the world about what it's like to be um, in long-term remission after CAR T cell. Why do you do that, Jonathan? Why do I do that? Well, that's a good question, actually. Um, so I had an early, so my mantle cell lymphoma um, came back, relapsed in 2018. And I was really lucky to be able to get on a trial because at the time there was nothing. But the trial had, had just moved to Europe and I was one of the first patients to have it. Um, and so there was a quite heavy uh, um, cytokine release syndrome. So I ended up in intensive care and I lay there in intensive care with sort of wires coming out of me, beeping, lights. And it was sort of a, I don't know, it's really hard to describe. Um, but I just lay, lay there and thought, if I make it through this, then I'm going to tell my story to everybody. Absolutely everyone, I won't hold back. Okay. And I don't. <laughs> and actually, I find it therapeutic, weirdly. I, every time I tell the story, I feel just a little bit, I don't know, a little bit better, or I can, I can normalise it a little bit more. So yeah. it's good for me too. Okay. My most pressing question, Jonathan, five and a half years in, what do you think doctors need to know about from a patient's perspective? Because they know about the science, they know about, yeah. okay, we can expect these side effects and this is the statistical significance. What are the things that they don't know? Mm, that's a good question. Well, well, I don't want to generalise because I've met many doctors and many amazing doctors and also some who perhaps are less understanding. Um, thing that I think sort of in general is I have a disease and they and that's their job to, you know, they're the experts on my disease. But I'm really the expert on me. And I think that's the difference, is what is it about me, Jonathan, um, that would help me cope with everything? Mm -hmm. So it's the psychological aspects, it's the quality of life, it's uh, my partner, my wife. It's the things that, that make me, Jonathan, asking more about that and letting me be the expert to drive it. Okay. Um, would be great. I mean, one really good example is so I have um, um, B cell deficiency so I need uh, immunoglobin um, and I used to have that every month as an infusion in the hospital which was a real pain because I had to go to the hospital and you always waited and people were lovely and nice but it just was a hospital and I really would prefer not to go back to hospital it's traumatic then in Holland the Netherlands we're really lucky to have a home service so they the nurse, uh, nurses come to your home and hook you up which is just incredible. It's just a wonderful service. And the best thing is it's good for everyone because it saves money and it's good for the patient. So it's really fantastic. But then I discovered you can uh, have subcutaneous immunoglobin. So now I just pick up my stuff. I do everything myself. I, I do it weekly. But it means I can travel again. I don't have to be home. Um, I, I have such a freedom. So that's an example of quality of life. You're thinking from the patient's perspective you can really improve quality of life just by fixing the, that kind of logistical stuff. Five and a half years in, what are, what are the things that are now coming up to the surface? Um, you know, mm. recently we saw um, a little bit more hubbub around long-term side effects. Is that something that you're sort of got on your mind? Um, yes, I kind of have to. So I have two, well, three real long-term side effects. One is the immunoglobin that I mentioned. Um, the second is somehow my bone marrow isn't as good as it used to be. And so if I get a virus, particularly in the winter, if I get a virus or some sort of infection, then I can't make all the blood cells, the bone marrow can't make all the blood cells it needs and my neutrophils tank. And then I'm susceptible to mucosotis or to infections. Um, so I take growth factor to help, but it still yo-yos up and down. Um, 
but it, it's manageable. Um, yeah. Last year I got pneumonia, which wasn't so nice. This year, so far, it's been good. <laughs> Um, but the one that's actually the one that is the most surprising for me is the psychological effects. Um, I was kind of the person that would have said, I'm fine. You know, if you'd asked me straight after the, 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 the CAR T-cell or last, even up until last year, I'd have said, no, I'm fine, I'm good. But actually inside or inside my head, I was anything but good. I had some PTSD symptoms and I was... Um, a lot of death anxiety and fear of relapse, and I was projecting it onto my wife in a way that I didn't understand. So we really had a crisis last year, and, and we're building back. We have therapy, both of us couples and individual therapy, um, and it's helping, but I, I really wish I'd known ahead of time. I mean, I don't know, is that crisis sometimes is a good thing because it came to the surface and we did something about it, but it, it was unexpected. Is there anything else that you would that you would like to talk about that you aren't often asked about or that you maybe might not have a forum for normally? That's a very good question. Um, actually, what I... So in the Netherlands, um, I was actually the first mantle cell lymphoma patient in Europe um, to have CAR T-cell therapy as part of the trial. And they came to the trial because the hematologist in Amsterdam is a real rock star. And I just was really lucky. You know, I was in the right place. If I'd been born a little earlier or if I hadn't lived near Amsterdam, it just wouldn't have been available and I, I wouldn't be here. I'd be dead. And, and the thing that gets me is that's still true all over the world and all over Europe. And even in the Netherlands, the mantle cell lymphoma is not... Uh, it's, it's, it's approved, um, but it can't be reimbursed, which means that patients like me have only access through trials. And trials are wonderful things, but they're maybe not the best way to treat patients. And so there are people like me all over Europe and, and in Germany, but in the edges of Europe, in the Czech Republic, in Bulgaria, all over Europe, and of course the rest of the world, who just are not as lucky as I was. And that gets me, that really does. So where do you think that the issue lies? But the system doesn't, and so it's not the doctors it's the system that somehow is way behind yeah. this cutting edge I mean this meeting is fantastic and you hear about the most incredible breakthroughs but the system's just not ready for it it's still stuck in well let's just feed poison to people and it'll be fine and it's not I mean it's partly cultural and partly generational but it's also just <laughs> there's a gap there's a yeah. lack of understanding I think of this cutting edge stuff and a lack of appreciation, and it's getting worse because the research, you can hear it on the yeah. auditorium, the research is going at light speed this way, and the hospital systems around the world are just kind of inching forward, forward. forward. Yeah. and that's not a good way to be. I don't know how to solve it, but hey, I feel it. Maybe it's something that we need to also bring. Well, I had to, well, so that I thought is, because someone emailed me a few weeks ago from Belgium, um, I don't know how they got my number or my email, I think through one of the patient advocates, and they said that my, he was struggling. His partner has mantle cell lymphoma, but a funny, indolent form, mm -hmm. which is very, very rare. Um, and because he has no visible signs of the disease, he doesn't enter, get into a trial, and the standard for care is the standard watch of care, yeah. which is watch and wait. And, and I started to think that maybe... Maybe that's a way around this, so that if those persons sitting in the, you know, in the village in Germany just thinks, doctor tells me this, it must be true, how do we get to that person that they come to us? And we say, no, actually, there's an, al there's an alternative. Well, how, how is your life? You know, let's yeah. have that and have maybe patients or patient advocacy groups or organizations um, help with that outreach, help reach these people and help them at least get a second opinion. Yeah. Because I think patients, you know... <laughs> In the end, it's our lives, yeah. and and the only thing that's lacking is not the motivation; it's the knowledge. It's almost like pe like I've heard it in other in other things. Patient navigators like come in. Okay, yeah. what are options that might be available to me, and how can I seek information exactly. about it? Yeah, and where do I go, and what are the alternatives? And and the other thing is, so quality of life, I think, is is so different at different stages of your life. So when I first was diagnosed, um, my kids were younger. Um, they were just sort of starting college. Um, their mother was still alive. Um, 
I got ill and okay, I, I, I wanted to live, but if I died, at least someone had to look, someone could look after the kids. So when I did the living will for the hospital, it had, you know, it's like, don't resuscitate. You know, if, if something bad happens, then okay, that's it. Sorry, but, you yeah. know. but when I came for my relapse and the, and the scar T cell therapy, my first wife sadly had passed away. So it was just me and the kids were older, but still not adult really. And so my instructions changed completely. Yeah. Because I was in a different place, just like four years, three years later. And I think if I was, you know, in 20 years' time from now, if I'm 80, well, you know, I have had a fabulous life. I'm really not going to go say, yeah, you know, hook me up to the latest stuff. Yeah. You know, and, and I think so not only do are different patients have different needs, different, a single patient, patient had different, has different needs. Different priorities at different times, yeah. And that I think is really important. And quality of life picks that up. And so that's why I kind of bang on about quality of life also in clinical trials, and also as a measure of how effective cancer therapy is. You know, how is your life? Is it better? Because if it isn't, is that really good? Is that doing what physicians should do? Extending life for the sake of extending life rather than for... Exactly, because it's a data point on a... I mean, that's being a bit harsh, but, you know, yeah. it's a data point on a graph, which is great, but should, is that patient really happy with long-term difficult side effects and a compromised quality of life and you know and it's yeah. it's a dilemma um but let's talk about it is my <coughs> my theory okay so success story at five and a half years but still a long way to go for other patients with car t cell therapy yeah and i'm not going to stop talking about it because it, it's life-changing totally and i want to give that gift to other people if we can Fantastic. That is definitely how I'd like to end this. Thank you, Jonathan, so much for being here, for sharing yeah, this with us. My pleasure, really. As, as um, I said, my promise to myself, I will I'll say yes to any invitation like this. <laughs> okay. I'm very happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the listeners for tuning into this podcast episode of EHA Unplugged. <laughs>